Okay, this is really the home stretch. So uh, I think we've, we've prepared, um, or, or um, we, we had prepared for us a, a, a real treat for you today. And, um, and it's got a number of kind of surprises and, and things inside it. And it's the final panel, um, which, which had a title uh, from the start, a working title. That was sort of the working title for the whole event, Nordic Ways. Um, and you'll see why in a second. Um, to lead this panel, uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Jay Bruns III. Jay is an affiliate instructor and advisory board member of the Scandinavian Studies Department at UW here in town. A relatively recent transplant to Seattle. Um, before that, he's been, he's really been around. He's been a, a, an exchange student in Denmark. So he's, he's perhaps the only non-Scandinavian I've heard who fluently switches between Scandinavian languages. Um, he's also been an act, acting ambassador um, in Norway. Uh, and at the U.S. Embassy in, in Oslo, and, and other than that, has a has a, a bio that's you know I, I, I think it's actually worth reading, but I'm not going to read it for you. So uh, Jay, uh, very very star-studded panel. You have the, the task of leading, and, and I hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berger, and I would like to ask the uh, members of the panel. Uh, to come on up while I uh, kind of give some opening remarks. As you can imagine, it's always really fun to be the last, uh, part of the last panel of the day, but I've been told that we really are to end uh, on time, and I'm sure that, that that's going to happen, but you're going to learn some interesting things between now and then. Uh, I'm delighted to be your moderator for this session. As, a, as President Obama famously said when hosting the Nordic countries two years ago, these countries, quote, consistently punch above their weight. Now, he was talking about their international contributions, and we'll learn some more from this panel what leads to such outsized contributions in other ways as well. Personally, I'm fascinated by this topic. I've watched the development of this region on and off for my entire adult life, starting as a high school exchange student, then in college for a year, uh, then uh, with two postings in, in uh, Norway. And then last year, I uh, worked with, uh, uh, with the Executive Director for the United Nations Environment, uh, another uh, person from this, uh, from this region. And now I get to learn and observe uh, from the perch of the Scandinavian Studies Department at the University of Washington and my membership at the Nordic Museum. We are honored to have assembled an unparalleled group of thought leaders on this topic who know and live these Nordic Way values, Nordic Ways values. I'm going to introduce the other panelists soon, but first I want to give the floor to Dagfinn Højbroten, who is the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Secretary General Højbroten's distinguished career has included service as minister in both of the Bonavik governments, and of interest to the Seattle community, I think, especially the global health community, is that he served as chairman of the board uh, for the Gavi Al uh, Vaccine Alliance. You can read more about his impressive record of public service in the program. Also under his le leadership, by the way, uh, the Nordic Council has been very supportive of this museum. Uh, Secretary General Hoipo. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, an honor for me to be here in this fantastic venue uh, and uh, represent the official cooperation between the governments of the five Nordic countries, uh, along with Greenland, Faroe Islands and Holland Islands. The Nordic countries population is just about 27 million people uh, and uh, the combined 11th biggest economy in the world and we share similar values and ways of organizing our societies. And I'm proud to say that the Nordic cooperation is one of the oldest and most comprehensive regional cooperation between countries in the world. We started out 60 years ago with a common passport free union before that idea had caught on in other regions of Europe. 
and then followed by a labor, common labor market, common education market, as well as conventions on social security, which benefit both Nordic citizens and uh, businesses. What is the idea about these small countries coming together and cooperate and integrate? I think you can formulate it in a, in a very brief way by saying that it is to explore and utilize the added value of our proximity. Proximity, yes, you can look at on the map, it's out in the hole there, and you can see that the countries are close together, geographically. You can learn from uh, the museum here about our common history. We're close together historically. You can also uh, study our social structures and our ways of organizing our societies. Yes, there is a proximity, a similarity. We, uh, to a large extent, also understand each other's languages. So we're close. And the, the Nordic cooperation is about uh, utilizing this added value of our proximity. But at the core of our proximity, are the common values. And I have been given just a few minutes here, so I, I won't elaborate on all those common values, but I will give you three examples of core Nordic values and relate that to how that facilitates uh, development in business and innovation. Because it, it, is, it comes together. And Often we see that our core Nordic values guide the way we work together and innovate. And among these core values, I'd like to highlight trust, gender equality, and sustainability. Social trust. That's the kind of trust we feel towards people we don't know at all. We meet in the street and we have a tendency to, to basically trust people or we have not. In the Nordic countries, we have that tendency to basically trust people that we don't know. There is no region in the world where you find higher uh, levels of social trust than in the Nordic countries. And I don't need to use a lot of words to convince you that that is a great advantage. Because when you have that basic trust in the field, a trust of people, a trust of institutions and a trust in business relations. You do not have to control and regulate to the same extent that you have when that trust is not there. So trust is a very efficient thing when a society is, is developing. So um, uh, this is obviously also something that catalyzes innovation and export activities. Uh, one concrete example that we're doing right now uh, is uh, developing Nordic innovation houses. We have one in Silicon Valley, it was a great success. We started one last year in uh, New York and now uh, we move on to Singapore and Hong Kong. Trust is at the core of this cooperation when it comes down to this very practical ways of working together. Trust is good for people, it's good for society, and it's good for business. Furthermore, we work together on strengthening the Nordic startup and scale-up ecosystem, which has been an important topic here today. Uh, and we do that uh, by running a public-private partnership called Nordic Scalers, and we improve, uh, uh, we, we work to improve financing by tying Nordic early stage investor markets closer together and we'll soon publish a, a review on how to excel this work even further. Gender. The Nordic countries are among the most gender equal countries in the world. We're not perfect, but we are leaders in many areas. And um, what we see is that gender equal labor markets, as we have to a large extent, a larger extent than anywhere else in the world, in the Nordic countries, uh, is good for business. Not just in terms of profits, but also as a necessity for businesses to thrive and grow. 
Gender equality drives transparency, fairness, and ensures that businesses bear their part of social responsibility. In a few days, we'll publish a new report that has been developed uh, through a cooperation between the Nordic Council of Ministers and the OECD. And it uh, shows that in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland, the increases in women's employment, because these labor markets have uh, some of the highest levels of women's uh, employment rates in the world. And the increases in women's employment alone account for 10 to 20 percent of the average GDP per capita growth over the last 40 to 50 years. That means it's been extremely profitable for our Nordic countries to see uh, that uh, increase in women's participation in the labor force. And that has been facilitated, of course, by many efforts uh, and social measures that I won't have time to go into. But it's good for people, it's good for our societies, and it's good for business. Sustainability is another core value of the Nordic countries. In order to um, investigate how climate efforts and competitiveness were interlinked, we have conducted just recently, was published two weeks ago, a study in the Nordic region where we have asked CEOs and chairs and management, top management of some of the leading companies in the uh, five Nordic countries uh, some questions about sustainability and, and uh, commercial uh, opportunities and growth. These companies represent 540,000 employees they represent 17% of the GNP, and almost all the companies answer in this study that climate efforts can boost their competitiveness. We had a meeting with the climate ministers and some of these business leaders in Stockholm two weeks ago when this report was launched, and the leaders' clear message to the political uh, representatives, to the ministers, where that give us ambitious targets. Uh, let the Nordics lead the way. Uh, put the bar higher, because that will make us competitive. That will help us compete when in, in, the, in our contribution to the green transition out in, in the uh, international markets. So um, this is a very clear documentation that these businesses really see a uh, front-runner role of the Nordic countries in the green transition, in the adaptation uh, that needs to take place in our societies in order to reach our, our, the climate uh, agreement targets. Um, the, uh, the businesses are not uh, in the back seat, they are in, up front, in the driver's seat, and they are challenging the politicians to really make use of this important dynamic between uh, ambitious goals and even regulations and innovation that creates growth, market opportunities. It's often underestimated, this interaction between regulation, innovation, and, and market opportunities. But these leaders see it, and they challenge the politicians. Sustainability, a core Nordic value, it's good for people, it's good for societies, it's good for the world, it's good for business. So with these words, uh, Mr. Chair, I um, will say that we are, as Nordic countries, uh, we are, we're not known to be so uh, bragging about ourselves, I don't know if you heard the story about the Norwegian, there are lots of them around here. He loved his wife so much, he almost told her. <laughs> so we are we're quite modest people. But we think that we have some strongholds, we think that we have some experiences, we think that we have some values that we're not out to preach, but to share our experiences. And the Nordic Prime Ministers have taken an initiative called Nordic Solutions to Global Challenges, where, we, where the three pillars are Nordic Green, Nordic Food and Welfare, 
and the Nordic gender effect. And this is the way we try to not export our ideas, but to, to uh, share what we think is, uh, has worked well for us with a wider uh, community. And um, one of the flagships in this initiative is called Nordic Sustainable Cities, which was a, a key topic when the Nordic Prime Ministers just met with the Indian Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi, in Stockholm just a few days ago. Um, so we're out there sharing uh, some of our experiences and uh, the fact that these values uh, can not, are not just for big banquet speeches, but they are really a part of a social fabric that makes a good framework also for businesses to, inno to innovate, to grow and to thrive. Thank you very much for your uh, Hello, my name is Andra Shimoni and, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, kind of uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my staff sat down and we went to a restaurant in Washington DC and we wrote down an idea on a napkin. <laughs> oh, come on, that's funny. <laughs> and the idea was, shall we try the impossible to write an academic book people will actually read? That was funny too. So I just want to say, this is really the, the, the result of, of, of that work and I'm so, so, um, so proud to have been supportive of or, or having done this project and it's, it's really 44 rock and rollers, the top of rock. And by the way, I'm really scared because Abba is sitting behind me and waiting for me to get off stage. But I, I just want to say that, you know, I, we have some of the most fascinating authors in this book the top of the top of Nordic societies. And by the way, for the last 15 minutes, I've been kind of wondering, and this is where I might revise the book, I was wondering if, if when, when Sweden and Norway go to war, if Denmark will stay neutral or not. I, that's something I was, you know, maybe I have to rethink the book. But I, I just want to say a couple of, of, of thoughts about, uh, about the book. The real idea here is we wanted to dispel this whole notion of uh, the Nordic societies being some kind of a socialist utopia. There is a misunderstanding about the Nordic countries. The Nordic countries are actually hardcore capitalists. Hardcore capitalists with a heart. And also I'd like to say that the world is at a crossroads. And meaning that there will be a choice whether we're going towards an authoritarian and effective way, or if we're going to go towards the democratic, liberal, and um, resilient way. And I, the, the idea behind the book was to present to the American reader the idea that yes, the Nordic uh, societies hold the stem cells to liberal de democratic societies of the future. They are not ready-made answers, but they are answers. It's more about the mindset. It's about how the Nordic countries have come to become to be the countries you have seen the whole day. Finally, I'd like to say that um, my, my father used to say you come to a museum not for nostalgia, but for inspiration. This museum is quite an inspiration. And Eric, congratulations to you. Congratulations to all of you. And of course, this brilliant idea uh, to have a dress rehearsal today because, <clears throat> because when you come to the real Washington, you will have to repeat this and that's going to be the real show. I will conclude by saying this is my, almost my, tomorrow is my last day at Johns Hopkins University. I'm taking the Nordic Ways Project to George Washington University and a better proof that I'm doing the right thing to take in, taking this project to the engineering school is this day. I will be taking it to the engineering school and you'd better come and visit me, all of you. And ambassadors, thank you so much. I'll disappear and now the floor is Abba. <laughs> Turning to our panel, we have three distinguished ambassadors. We have two uh, uh, poli uh, uh, politicians, uh, elected officials, 
uh, well, actually three, because and uh, on this panel we have one Icelander, the first and only Icelander, I think, on the panel. Let me start with the ambassadors. We have, as you know, the uh, and you'll see in your in your information, we have uh, the uh, ambassador uh, from Norway uh, to the United States, Kora Os, the ambassador from Finland to the United States, Ambassador Kelpi, and, and uh, the ambassador from Sweden to the United States, Ambassador Olaf Stanton. Uh, I should say something. I know that the, uh, I've seen it over my career. The, the Nordic countries send the, only their very best to the United States, and that's definitely the case today. And I would say, especially the way the world is going right now, they are probably really earning their salaries these days. <laughs> um, I, uh, we, uh, you've uh, uh, met Secretary uh, General Hoy Broten, and the other politician uh, uh, from Norway is a member of the Storting is is Jorod uh, Aspjel, who represent who is a member of the Labour Party and represents the area of Sør-Trøndelag, which includes the city of Trondheim. And then uh, finally, we have uh, Thorbjörg. Um, who is a CEO of a startup company in Iceland. So let, I'm going to ask each person uh, one question, but then I hope uh, we can quickly get to uh, questions that you all have, so I hope you'll think of some. Uh, I want to turn, I guess, to uh, Thor Bjork first. Uh, we were just talking, and you, I think, during the course of the day, felt we uh, have not um, uh, focused enough on the value of the social welfare system. So I want to ask you to comment on what you meant by that. Yeah, hey, thank you. I'm a little bit embarrassed to be here with all these ambassadors and politicians, but I used to be a politician, so I have a little bit to say. Um, yes, thank you. I, I'm sort of a case study of an entrepreneur. Uh, enjoying and um, very happy to say that the Nordic cooperation is working really, really well. And at the same time, I was missing from today's lectures that the actual um, heart of things in Scandinavia's education and health, which is a stronghold for our cooperation and flat, uh, flat um, equality, and it really is the standard in the Nordics. And we didn't touch on that, but there's a lot of things going on in welfare tech and health tech and educational tech that is really prosperous. And I would want to, to share if that is possible to this group at, at some time later, maybe. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Kalpi, I am told that the Consumer Technology Association recently uh, in an international innovation score, scorecard graded 38 countries and that Finland uh, was number one on that list and was the, n noted as the innovation champion. Are these Nordic ways something that uh, helped Finland win that? What, how, how, would you, how do you look at uh, that, that award? Thank you. Uh, actually, all the Nordic countries were in the top 10, so we are all doing very well. Um, and yes, it's basically uh, what unites us, um, that has been the topic of the day, uh, that makes us also succeed. Uh, as far as Finland is concerned, maybe uh, the most important thing, I would say the most important value is equality. And the most important practical uh, way to implement equality has been education. And our education system, especially the primary education system, is very good and really has, through that education system, we have been able to harness the potential of the whole population. Now, that is also a big challenge because the world is changing and a good education system today is not a good education system tomorrow. So we are trying to figure out what would be the uh, right education system for, for the future. But I also wanted to go back to, to, to actually the previous uh, keynote speaker and I was very grateful because he didn't mention Finland at all. <laughs> and um, uh, or maybe just in one occasion. And especially he didn't mention how, the, how we did in the last Winter Olympics. Uh, we used to be the superpower, <laughs> but we are not anymore. But we have been innovating uh, also in that sphere in sports. And we have come up with some new sports like um, 
wife carrying and throwing your mobile phone, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we have innovated in order to stay on top. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Ambassador Olaf Stopter. Uh, I, a lot of people associate uh, the Nordic countries with an ambitious gender equality agenda. And I understand that the Swedish government has now um, declared itself as the first feminist, feminist government. What does that mean and how does that connect with this Nordic way that we're talking about? Well, thank you very much. And first of all, congratulations to Eric and the museum. Uh, I don't know if this is inspired by Finland. Uh, are we in a sauna right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, so, so thank you for that. Um, yes, my government uh, declared itself as first, the first feminist government, and I think it comes out of a feeling that enough is enough. Uh, we've been talking about these issues for so long, uh, and a lot has happened in our countries. Uh, Sweden is doing quite well, but not enough. So the government is feminist, uh, has a feminist policy, and that means that all policies that are taken by the government has to do an analysis. We have to do an analysis of what does this mean for gender equality? Does it have any bearing? If not, okay. If it does, so what do we do about it? How can we tweak the legislation so that it is equal and, and really uh, supports both men and women? Because this is, of course, important for so many reasons. It's the right thing to do, uh, first of all. And second, like uh, you said, uh, Secretary General, it's also good economics. Uh, you know, we have an employment rate of 80% when it comes to women. This country in the United States, I think the employment rate of women is 65, 67%. So there's a huge uh, improvement possibility, which of course brings, strengthens the economy a lot. Uh, and also when it comes to foreign policy, we have realized that if you, for instance, are going to do peace negotiations, if you don't involve women, the peace will not be as stable as if you involve, of course, all sectors of a society. So there are many reasons. Um, and enough is enough. Thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Aspiel, uh, when reading your, uh, your background, you started out in the working world, uh, then you went into labor politics and local government, and now you are not only a member of uh, the Norwegian par Parliament, you're also a member of the Nordic Council, I understand. Uh, from all of those things, what, what kind of, uh, uh, what takeaways do you have on this Nordic ways idea? Yeah, first of all, let's uh, thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, it's the first time I've been in Seattle, so I look forward to see the town a little bit later. Um, so to say, I have been, uh, yeah, uh, been a politician from when I was 20, 17 years, in a youth organization and a workers' organization and something like that. But I think it's, um, it's just in the Nordic ways. Uh, some Doug would say we are nearly 27 million people here. And this is uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, economy in the world, is here together. And uh, why is it so? I think we have a lot of uh, reserves in this, all this country, about the forest, uh, minerals, gas, oil, fish, and something. But I think this is, uh, the most important thing is um, and, uh, all the people and, uh, have a high education, uh, have um, competence and better they have unemployment people are working and give back to the uh, to the, our country so but it doesn't trust between uh, the systems between organization between the uh, people and the politician is very important so we uh, can uh, cooperate between uh, difficult uh, questions so thank you very much and now, Ambassador Bos, I know um, you have spent a lot of time in the United States uh, uh, as ambassador, uh, kind of bringing a lot of what the, uh, these Nordic ways are and, and kind of introducing them here. What, uh, what, what has Norway been doing recently that you've been involved with, and uh, how, how do you think of this? No, thank you, thank you, Jay. And uh, first of all, congratulations to Eric and his team for this museum. It's, I mean, it's gorgeous, it's, it's fantastic. Then I would like to say that uh, Andra Simoni was talking about ABBA uh, and uh, I have to tell you that he, he, he's a rock star himself and uh, he's playing a guitar as nobody else in, 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 in Washington DC but more importantly, more importantly is that Andras, 
he has been the champion of Nordic in lifting uh, the Nordic cooperation in the United States and he was responsible for, 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 for this book. But I will also say that what the Nordic countries, what we have been doing for the last 18 months, we have been traveling this country, and it's so great also to see Ambassador Björn Lundvall here. He was part of this project, and we traveled around in this country. And what is interesting is really that the Americans, they want to learn more about the Nordic model. And I think the Secretary General, he really spelled out what this is all about. But what I add to, to your question, Jay, is that I think that the, 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 the intention of all of us representing our governments and our countries is really to strengthen the relationship and the cooperation between our individual countries and, and the United States. And that goes uh, without sort of taking notice of who is in the White House uh, at a certain time or during the years or whatever. It's really to build that, that relationship. And, and, and specifically on your question of what Norway is doing, I can tell you that this morning, we had a, 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 a seminar, a conference uh, with Governor Inslee uh, in, the, in the state of Washington. And there we were discussing with representatives from the Norwegian private businesses, uh, the trade unions, uh, the government, uh, civil society, inter entrepreneurs and, and investors, how Norway and the United States can cooperate on electrification of ferries. That's one example. What's important with that project is that, that it has to do something with electrification of ferries, but more broadly, it's really a response also uh, to the Paris Agreement. And that is, I mean, we are trying to identify these areas of cooperation, and I think all of our Nordic countries, we have been very, very successful in that regard. And yourself, you referred to the, the, the summit uh, President Obama hosted uh, with the five Nordic uh, heads of state. That was a great event. But it was yet again another sort of significant example of how the United States wants to work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to open the floor to questions. Uh, uh, I see one over there. I was just going to say, we have a good example of the, that same kind of cooperation because Norway helped build a whole bunch of fishing fleet here years ago with the uh, innovative motors and new electronics and all kinds of stuff. So this has already happened in the past. That's right. We started back in the 18th century, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Just recently we were invited by President Trump to come here with more people. <laughs> more questions. Well, uh, waiting for someone to come up. I, I've got uh, one about the, uh, the uh, Alfred Nobel and the way he organized himself on the Nobel, uh, uh, giving out the Nobel awards in, uh, in, uh, from Sweden and then the Nobel Peace Prize from Norway. I'm just uh, wondering uh, if uh, both Ambassador uh, Olofsdottir and Ambassador Os could comment a little bit on how you see their, uh, his, his legacy. And I know we've, uh, we have uh, some people in the room who represent the Nobel Foundation in Sweden. So, uh, but I'm curious to... Of course, that was a big mistake. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But at the time, uh, Norway had already, I mean, you can fill me in on the history of Norway, of course, but uh, striving to, to be independent and then became independent from Sweden in 1905. And um, at that time, uh, the Nobel, first Nobel Prize was given out in 1901. Uh, so he recognized, I am sure, uh, the people of Norway and the capital of Norway uh, as an important place in the union that was still between our two countries. Uh, so I guess that's the reason for, for it to be so. And I think that's a great thing today, uh, to show the unity uh, that we had our history, uh, but also the role that the Peace uh, Committee plays in Oslo. I don't have much to, to add to what uh, my, my Swedish colleague said, but I think that uh, uh, the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize has had sort of a, sometimes a challenging history, and what my government is saying is really that the Nobel Committee is an independent uh, organization. That's nothing to do with the Norwegian government. That's, 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 for, that's how it is, and that is how it's going to continue to be. Then, I, then, then uh, what I have experienced is really that the interests and, uh, globally uh, for the Peace Prize is really increasing day by day or year by year. So it's really also an, 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 uh, an important uh, contribution uh, to individuals or organizations 
uh, working for peace, uh, working for stability, and for solving conflicts. And, and in that regard, I must say that Norway, we are very, very happy that, that Alfred Nobel made that decision, uh, that uh, that prize was going to be, be sort of issued by the Nobel Committee in Oslo. I see we have a question here. Sure, I'm Janice Mishala, and I have a firm called Paladin Partners, and I work with entrepreneurs and, and investors, and I'm an angel investor. One of the things I'm quite interested in is the leadership that the Scandinavian countries have taken uh, with women on boards um, and the push towards uh, increasing the percentage of women on boards, but also the, the push that Iceland has had to say we're not making that progress and we're going to mandate more push. Um, I'm curious about, there's so much data that sits in your countries about this in terms of what it's done for companies and, and I think that um, it could help accelerate our, our movements here in the United States because I think it could help our global economies uh, even move faster and become more successful. So if anybody would like to comment on that whole area, because I think that we're not making nearly the progress we need to be making in our country, and I think that you, you all could be tremendous leaders in this area. Thanks. Please. Um, yes, since I'm the Icelandic person, I'll try to do this. Um, for a while, we debated on putting anything into law for a long, long time, but we didn't see any progress, even though there was talk and promises and change directives. So it ended up being a law that women had to be present 40% or either gender of the board. And this is changing very much, very much the view that the companies have and actually, like they have been saying, it's good for business because the views of women are finally represented. So the next steps that have, have been taken is, are just recent, that's equality and pay. And uh, we don't, some, some, something about our island of 300,000 people is that we do things that we think is a great idea but we haven't thought it through. <laughs> that's a little bit like what we do, like uh, inclusion in school, we just fixed it all but we have all, all these problems left to fix. But um, this is actually, everybody is agreeing on this, except for a small, small minority of right-wing people. But um, they, they have tasks now to, to put in notion, you know, as a um, yearly assessment of a company, this will be a data from the company as well. Yes, um, and from Norway you can see too, we have a good example here. Uh, Christian, now the speaker earlier, to be the leader for the, this organization. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's very important to have the systems in each uh, countries to can have uh, equality. Uh, we have the shield garden, so the children can be in there today. Uh, the man and the lady can uh, have the education, to work, have some uh, uh, this uh, the type of jobs. So it's very important we have the systems in the Norden so we can take care of this and, uh, and we can uh, talk forward for all the ladies to so do a very good job. And uh, you see the university in Norway today, I think it's just more ladies take a higher education or men's and uh, the guys as well. Thank you. Uh, well, I know Ambassador uh, Kalp, you also wanted to comment. Yes. And then, and then Thor Bjorg, if you wanted to. In in, in, in Finland, uh, we have mostly not relied on quotas. There are only quotas for nominated bodies, like if you send a delegation out, you have to have 40% of both genders. Mm, and actually, by the way, for instance, in the foreign minister, uh, a more usual problem is to get 40% uh, of men to, to, to the delegations. We have, by the way, 50% of ambassadors uh, of Finland are women. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in the, in the companies, in the enterprises, listed enterprises, what they have done is to have sort of a self-regulation. They have set for themselves collectively a target. It's only 30% and they have uh, more or less reached it. So I think it's an interesting interesting way to try to do something about this issue. 
On gender equality more generally, we are all, I think, in a good place, but we, I think, all also see that nothing is irreversible. You have to, you have to be very vigilant. And uh, there are also new challenges which very easily result in, in more inequalities also regarding the position of genders. I would also like to say uh, that in all uh, spheres of life, uh, politics, uh, business, culture, sports, everything, uh, visibility is very important. It has a big impact on how uh, uh, role models are seen. So I think that's one thing. It's not only the, the numbers as a whole, but the visibility of both genders. I just want to add to the question a little bit better, because um, the reason the Nordics are at this point is not um, the law now, it's because of preschool. Um, it's because getting women support and social support to get to work. So that's something that the US hasn't even taken baby steps towards. So it's kind of like the first major thing that needs to be done before we can talk about the next step, which is getting them on the top level. Ambassador, uh, yes, and I just want to add that Sweden is not doing so well uh, on this. Um, when it comes to uh, publicly listed companies, only 6% of the CEOs are female. Uh, and we have not legislated on quotas uh, on boards. I don't think we will either. Uh, we are doing better uh, than we did before, but I don't think we are really close to Norway and, um, and uh, Finland uh, there. So, so this is something, you know, I said before, we have a high employment rate of women, but getting women to the top in the, in the privately listed companies is, has been uh, tougher. I will just observe that with this panel of six very distinguished people, uh, three are uh, half are women. So I uh, don't know if that's, a, I doubt that that's a, a uh, that's not an example. We have another question. Uh, yeah, um, more like a statement, really. Uh, so I'm, I'm Knut, uh, I'm an employee. I've been an employee in Norway and in the, in the US, more specifically Silicon Valley. And uh, what I've noticed is my ability to innovate as an employee is largely impacted about the amount of nonsense I have to deal with. Uh, and uh, take for example, uh, like healthcare is like a, a major example. Uh, like, a like about a couple of months ago, I, uh, I was on a plane, I felt some funny pain in my chest. So I better check that out, chests are important. So, uh, so I, I, go, I go to the hospital, get that checked out. Didn't take too long, um, it turned out to be nothing, so I'm all good. Uh, and in, in Norway, that would have been the end of it. I would have paid them $50, I would have gone home, forgot about it. Uh, that price was about 20 times as much in the US, but that's not the point. I, I could afford that. I was, there was no problem with that. The point was, I got like 10 different bills spread across the course of uh, three months. I had to negotiate between insurance companies and these uh, the different institutions that I had to, uh, had to pay money to. And I spent literally three months of my life dealing with that like couple of hours I spent uh, just learning that I was fine. Uh, and that, that took away mental energy that I should have spent on innovating. And this is not the only example, there's plenty of examples where you just have to deal with so much nonsense in, in America that it really just takes your mental energy, energy away from doing stuff that you know, could improve people's lives or your the economy or innovation in general. I think you're getting some chuckles from the audience who know that experience very well, but I wonder the, if anyone here has a comment. I see uh, uh, Secretary General Hoyboten. Well, um, I, I uh, thank you for the testimony. <laughs> I think I think uh, your point is is uh, very important, um, and uh, I won't uh, preach to the U.S. how they should organize their healthcare system. Uh, there's enough of people doing that, but um, our experience is that it's possible to uh, achieve full coverage, universal health coverage, at a much lower cost, uh, much more efficient than the way it's done in the US. Uh, the, but the point here is that uh, a welfare system that is trusted creates an environment of uh, and an extent of social security and safety that 
uh, if things are going really bad with you, there, there is a safety net and you're not going to get broke. Um, and I think that helps innovation and uh, economic development. I not only think I know and we know that that is the case on an individual level, as was illustrated here, but also on the social level. I think I should point out here, you have been Norway's health minister, so he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, uh, I would also like to uh, endorse what the Secretary General has said, but I also have another example. Uh, and that's from, uh, from, from the embassy in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, there was one of the local employees, he was married to an American. And they got a baby, and she was working in one of the departments in Washington DC, I think it was the Department of Agriculture. So uh, she gave birth, she got four weeks of maternity leave, and he came to the embassy and said, uh, my wife, she has got, uh, we have got a baby. So from the Norwegian system, he got 48 weeks of paternity leave. <laughs> That's how it is, <laughs> and how it works. <laughs> Another question. Yes, uh, I had a question about uh, immigrants, and we're having a lot of backlash here in the United States regarding immigrants that come to the United States as a form of cheap labor to uh, better their social circumstances and stuff. My own Norwegian great-great-great-great-grandmother came here for a better life. Um, and so I was wondering, are you, are the Nordics having as much trouble, as much backlash towards people, say, Syrian refugees and uh, other minorities that are trying to start over within your countries um, to the extent that we are in the United States? <coughs> I guess I'll start as we've had the largest influx of, of, of asylum seekers last year. Uh, well, the Swedish labor market both has an issue with uh, that we need more skilled labor. So we actually want uh, people from other countries to, to, to come to Sweden and, and take up, up jobs where, where, we, where we need a lot of people. So that's one issue. Uh, the second issue is that we have always been very generous and open to, to uh, people fleeing from hard and tough circumstances. And, uh, we, of course, had a big influx uh, with the war in, in, in Syria, uh, which put quite a lot of strain on, on our society. I think, in general, Swedish people are quite uh, happy to receive people from other countries to help out. We are one of the richest countries in the world, so if we can't help, then who? Um, and this is a question I often get here in the States, what about the migration issue and so on. But of course it, it put a lot of strain on our society because we got so many. Uh, and we are now uh, processing a lot of these people to see if they will have asylum or not. And uh, the government has, has of course identified that the process is too slow. It takes about two years to go through this process and that's way too long for a person to have to, have to sit and wait. And then it also takes too long time for many of these people to get into the labor market, which is, of course, extremely painful and serious for the, for the individual, but it also creates strains in our society. So um, I think most political parties in Sweden are, we have an election in the fall, uh, this is an important issue where, which will be debated. How do we get our new citizens into the labor market, especially uh, much faster? And how do we train the people who don't have the right skills? Because we do lack uh, lack a lot of skilled labor. There is uh, certainly also a discussion in Finland going on, and and the big, uh, I think the uh, quality or or the contents of the discussion changed a lot after the uh, 2015 sort of wave when um, I think all of us uh, got, like Finland got 10 times the number of asylum seekers that you would normally get in a year, you got that in four months. Um, uh, the discussion is partially difficult, um, uh, but, um, and I think there are a lot of uh, real issues there as well, especially with this uh, 2015 experience in mind, because that was a situation when, when the, uh, 
the situation got totally out of hand and control. So uh, people really got this impression that this this is uh, this is never going to end, and there is no control at all. Um, but um, there is also, I think, an understanding that we do need immigration. This is uh, absolutely an understanding. I think everywhere in Europe, um, uh, something that is in the background and has an impact on the discussion is the fact that uh, we, we, we sort of anticipate that the migration pressure is going to increase a lot in the future. Uh, simply because of the different crises in the Middle East, in Northern Africa, and the population pressure in Africa as a whole, and the fact that the economic development in Africa is not uh, not uh, up to up to the same level as the population growth. So there are real issues. There there are also a lot of uh, fears. There are demagogues, uh, but uh, I think the discussion is sort of gradually improving. I, I concur with what uh, my Swedish and Finnish uh, colleague have just uh, just said. I think also from a Norwegian perspective, what we are saying is that it's very important also to to, to address the needs of the refugees uh, close to their countries. For example, in the neighboring countries of, of Syria, it's uh, instead of sort of bringing all of them to to, to, to Norway or to Europe, it's try, we, we need to try to meet their needs in the, closer to to their home cities, their, their home country, and uh, that is also why I think that Norway now is the fifth biggest uh, humanitarian contributor to to the Syrian conflict, for example. And, uh, and also, uh, I think that, as was said by my, my colleagues, is that 2015 was really a crisis. And I remember one of uh, our European colleagues in, 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 in Washington DC, he was from, from, from a continental uh, European country, and he, he was talking about an existential crisis at that time. And uh, so there were fear of many, many places, including in, in Norway. Now it has been, in, in a way, settled, it's much more stable. And I think that's also because of the agreement that European Union entered with, 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 with Turkey. And uh, so refugees now coming to Norway is now what was happened in the past. That was through the sort of the UN system and the High Commissioner for Refugees uh, recommending uh, refugees to, 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 to go to Norway, and we now have a quota, and that is being implemented uh, day, day, by day, day by day. Then I just want also to concur with what, what Kishti said, is that it's so important to solve this crisis in the Middle East, for example. We have to solve the Syria conflict, we have to solve Iraq, we have to solve uh, Afghanistan, and if not, people are will be will be coming. And during the Syria crisis, now during the refugee crisis, for example, in 2015, I think there were 52 different nationalities traveling to Norway seeking asylum, and they all said that they were Syrians or Afghans, but they were not. The three last people entering the border to Norway, they came from Cuba. Uh, just to, to, to tell you about sort of telling you about the, the, the magnitude, and uh, but also I think that so we have to solve the political and the military conflicts which we have, but at the same time, we of course also, as Kishti said, we have address to address the climate changes. Because if you're not going to solve the climate changes, people will start walking from, 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 from Africa, but also Asia and other, 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 other countries or other regions. Secretary uh, General Hoybroten will have the last word on this panel. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I think uh, what happened in 2015-2016 in was really a stress test for the Nordic cooperation because the Nordic countries handled this uh, pressure uh, that came uh, in different ways. And it was not easy at, at the beginning, but through a, a well-organized cooperation and an informal cooperation that is very strong between the leaders of these countries, we were able to sort that out and uh, today we have um, a fairly strong common cooperation program on integration uh, acknowledging that we may differ on issues uh, of uh, how many and who should be admitted but we can learn from each other uh, when it comes to uh, uh, how to integrate in a successful way and uh, to end i would say that if it hadn't been for immigration we wouldn't have been here today well, I want to, uh, as you can hear from the very end, I mean, cooperation and
scrutiny and concurring with one another seems to be a hallmark of the uh, uh, Nordic countries. And I thank you all, and I hope everyone will give them a big hand, a hand of applause for being here. To, to Eric, Eric Nelson, uh, the head of the Nordic Museum. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, uh, Steve. Panel, it's fantastic to uh, have such an amazing group of people assembled here. Thank you all so much for attending this innovation conference. Um, I'm a little bit odd. You know, museums really exist to excite people's curiosity and send them out into the world to do wonderful things. So, again, I think we've been successful in that today. So, thank you all, the participants, especially thank you, Berger, and the committee for putting on a fantastic conference. I want to thank, I have to thank our sponsors, Ericsson particularly for being our banner sponsor, presenting sponsor, eSmart Systems, Nordic Semiconductors, the Norwegian Maritime Authority, and additional support from the uh, Swedish, Cha Swedish American Chamber of Commerce. I'm hoping next year the Norwegian Chamber of Commerce step up too, Viga. Where'd you go? Anyway, just kidding. Um, yeah, we've got a ton of things going on tonight. We're going to invite you guys into the Sun Terrace on the tent for a cocktail or a drink if you'd like to stick around. At 6 o'clock, the museum is going to be hosting a reception that you're all invited to come to. At 8 o'clock, the Danish Foreign Minister and the Ambassador Lars Los and the Crown Princess, Her Majesty, will be here to launch a uh, cultural initiative from Denmark that will be all about culture and innovation in selected cities and locations in the United States. So we're thrilled to be the launch point for that as well.